See, this is another teardown video of some lab equipment. Maybe it's going to be a repair video, or maybe it's going to be a teardown, or a how this thing works. Let's find out. This is a really, really nice dual power supply with Ethernet and USB and uh, everything. If you look at the picture here, let's, I don't know. Yeah, here it is. This is why it arrived at my desk. So the screen is completely broken. Channel one is defect. And channel two is working. As far as I know. Let's find out if this is true. So we got mains supply, red button, and idle usage. All right, so. What is that? <laughs> that is one broken screen. But there's a... Is it a touch? So what happens? Channel 2? Aha! And then what is this? Channel 2 on off? Still nothing. But it says push long for live mode. Aha, uh -huh, that is all we have to do. And then what? Dial? Ah, channel two. Channel two is on off and then... So how the fuck do you... Ah, come new man. So this button. But I think I'm doing it right, yeah? Master on off. I'm an idiot. Of course, there's a master on off as well. Okay, and then a channel two. Okay, so three buttons you need to fool around with to get output. Okay, now we got the dial. Ha ha! It is in one volt, so that is 27. See? Every little click is exactly. Wow, this is amazing. It is this accurate. Whoa! And then all the way down, zero, and the first click. So that means channel two is working. Channel one. I would assume, let's see if this is right. Okay, let's dial. Aha, uh -huh, see? All the way down. Minus 0 0.2 and then one click up. Two, three, four, five, six, seven. Aha! Uh -huh. There is actually something happening when I turn the dial up and down. So there is a reaction, but not really what I wanted. So this is either in the output stage or driving, feedbacking. This is some analog stuff. That means it is possible to fix this, right? It should be fairly easy to fix. So let's see how we get in. How are we going to get in? This is that easy, is it? Those two screws and we ain't. Alrighty, I will be back. So when you unscrewed the two screws in the rear. Don't just pull and poke in this plastic. There is a little tap here. The trick is to pull on both sides like this. Then they're going to open. You can actually do it, see? Like this. Then you do this at the same time as you pull up. 
then you're gonna get it out. And then and then we get in. This is a very, very classic way to do this. Oh, it's really, really beautiful. What is that? This is the first thing that I see. Something that is black on a fuse. That is never good. I need to measure this fuse. What else can we see? It's always interesting to do the first inspection. Where is it? So that's the two different CERN systems. Some maybe the output on off control. Ooh, somebody's been poking around in here. Soldering something. So maybe that is some capacitors in one of the channels. Oh, that is the channel that is not working. So they've been poking around in this one. Oh no. I was hoping that nobody was in here before me because then it would be easier to fix. It is really, really beautiful. Look at that. So the input, really, really thin wires. And then there's a switch mode power supply just for pre-regulation and something. And then what is in here? I think we need to go and have a look. Oh, there's also another transformator and all sorts of stuff down there. This is of course for the connectivity. Output terminals. Oh, you look at that baby. Oh, this is big. So this is where all the control is, of course, really, really close to the displays and buttons and everything. So this is actually how most of the newer computer controlled power supplies, they are done. So you will have the CPU and the software and everything as close to the display as possible. Really, really normal. So I need just to get the display out anyway, because it's broken. But I also need to find out if I can fix this broken channel. There was nothing. So I need to go and get a screwdriver and open this. Let's have a look. We are in. Oh, holy crap canoe. Look at that. Some leftovers 
from a broken capacitor. This is the vomit of an electrolytic capacitor right there. So this is exactly why they changed some of these in that channel. So this blow up, but look at that. It is really, really fantastic. There is some reaction, but not enough. There's a microchip controller for each of them. Of course, they will be individually isolated. And this is why you have a transformator here and here. And all these components. And then, of course, the fan directly on top of it. So this is how it is cooled by directly blowing down directly on top of everything. But you got to see this. <laughs> I just saw this on top of the fan. Ooh, they didn't clean up all the puke. So it's all full here. Yummy. There was a big kaboom. An earth shattering kaboom. So this will be isolated communication. Wow, fantastic. I think I'm gonna go and look a little bit more deeper uh, into all this and then I will get back. So the main supply that makes the isolation to mains, that is a 48 volts, four amp. Wow, so this is our main input on the motherboard down here, and then it goes all the way here. So this PCB can actually support three outputs. You can also see it here, the outputs. So you can have one, two, and three, but only two of them are fitted. This channel here is not working. I already found the fault. This is the primary fit, and this is a diode. So this is just an isolated buck. It's because both of these outputs, they're of course individually isolated. So you have communication here, isolation communication to a DS pick that controls the entire PSU. And this is a decoupling capacitor of the 48 volts that's going down to all three supplies. And what you will see, remember the first thing I said was this fuse looks bad. Of course it does. This one is blown. And this is why one of the supplies is, is, is working and the other one is not. So this is the blown fuse for the sensor supply. And it's blown because of the primary fed. Here is actually completely shorted. It's very, very obvious when you just diode beep the three pins on this one, they're all completely shorted, and here they're not at all. So I'm going to desolder this fed and have a look. What is it called? We need to go all the way down here. This is just a normal TO252 and some heat, heat sink on top of it. So this is a um, step down buck, isolated buck. So for 48 volts, so I need a 100 volt fed. And uh, probably this is what I'm gonna do is take this out, put in a new fuse and then measure that I have a nice gate signal. If I got a really nice gate signal, then I'm also going to check the diode. And they only changed one of the capacitors, not both of them. One capacitor blew up and puked all over the place. So what I'm going to do is change both of the capacitors. That will be the original capacitors for the other channel. So it's most likely something wrong here, but I did check out 
that the the diode and the resistance measurements on the two sides is identical and I also checked a few of the output fets uh, to the output seems identical so we could be lucky it's only that one but so far so good I'm telling you desoldering this with hot air was a nightmare they really did all they could to cool this down as good and effective as possible there's a super short distance down to the inner layers and this makes this really really good thermally conductive so that means it's just a pain anyway it is out and of course the fed is completely shorted the broken fuse is out this one was from the back the diode is good so the output from the transformer goes through the diode through a common mode choke and out and all this beeps out to be absolutely all right and then identical to the other channel that is working so that means i go for it i just leave this fed open put in a, uh, a new fuse and then i'm going to measure if there's a gate signal all right the broken fed is called 320 n 20 n so now i know a lot more and i will be able to give a little bit deeper explain about how all this works in here let's rotate a little bit and look in the back left corner here what you see here is another little switch mode so this is the ic and a fed so this is the primary part of the oscillator this is actually three isolated plus minus outputs look how nicely they are balanced with all the filters since this supply is populated with only two outputs you can make a three output power supply with the same motherboard and this is also why the third auxiliary supply is not populated let's look a little bit more at the auxiliary supply so this is the oscillator and the power drive so this is driving all the three outputs the third is not populated so this is for output one and for output two output one goes actually in the inner layers and comes out here so you see it's positive and negative each one of them with the two diodes here the positive and the negative diodes filters and a ferrite on the ground of course and then we got the coils on the other side and capacitors again and again capacitors on this single point and this is exactly how you do a good switch mode design oh i could cry i've been talking about this for years how to do good switch mode uh, filtering with a, a single super point like this and then you take out a completely dead signal in a in, in this nicely balanced way with the ground in the middle and the positive and negative right like this see the output supply for for the for the first one goes here so what we have here on the other side is actually a little bit interesting look at that the classic 431 and an optocoupler so it's, of course it's regulated what it does is it regulates one of them for plus minus uh, 10 volts 
and this is what drives all the different auxiliary uh, systems on each of the power supplies. This one is the 3.3 volt supply for all the digital uh, circuits and analog circuits. Those are the, the classic digital isolators. This one is the one driving the primary side. Of course, the, this is an isolated side of the switch mode converter. So that was the fit that was uh, shorted. I just put in a random fit. Well, not completely random, but also a 200 volts uh, fit. So uh, that I could get this up and running. And the fit drive system is really, really funny made. Everything here, all those components, this is the fit drive done with discrete components. So all these tiny little three pins, it's actually NPN transistors. And we've got some diodes and capacitors and resistors. Look at all this. This one is a NPN PNP two in one. So this is the output push pull for the gate, the serious resistor for the gate and a pull down resistor when this is not enabled. When you disable the output, everything goes to off. And so the pull down resistor just keeps the gate low. Those are the gate sense resistors for the current sense. NTC sensor. This is directly under the power fed. So it's measuring, uh, the CPU is measuring the temperature of the primary side fed. I, I marked uh, a few other places where we have NTC resistors. So there's an NTC directly under the rectifier diode. So this one is also hot. There's one more. I'm going to talk about it in a few minutes. So the problem with the with this supply was I found uh, a blown up capacitor. Somebody else tried to change it. <laughs> it looks like really, really badly sold a job and they didn't clean up anything. I also saw a diode missing. So this is the reverse voltage protection diode of the input. This one is removed. So what they did to blow this up is they reverse the input. This way they shorted this one. And what else did they do? They blew up the voltage sense system so that the, the CPU is not measuring the output voltage at all. And this way it's giving full PWM. And this is why this one keeps blowing up. I repaired the entire gate driver was completely blown up which was a really, really annoying thing to figure out. So I've been down here measuring around here and changing components here. I even changed this, the push-pull, <laughs> the dual NPN PNP. And uh, so now I got a nicely, a nice, nice uh, gate driver signal. And I didn't have the 0 0.1 ohm resistor in a, a high current package. So I just went for one ohm resistors and just 20 of them. So I got the same current capabilities and the same resistance and everything. So I'm actually uh, quite all right with this. It just doesn't really look good, but it was good enough to boot this thing up. So because of uh, the lack of a voltage sense, this one actually generates 75 volts. And this is of course why it keeps blowing up the capacitors. Nothing here is rated uh, 75 volts. So, and I cannot figure out where the heck the voltage sense is and uh, why this is not giving the right signal back to the CPU and then the CPU is not turning down the PWM. So PWM is maximum at the very first go that I enable this output, I just get full PWM. So it just keeps blowing up capacitors. I, I just uh, removed the other one. But this one is getting really, really hot, really, really fast because it's only a 50 volts capacitor. 
So yeah. Also, you see another NTC here. So this NTC, this is actually a little bit funny to see. Yeah, to see this made like this. Look at those load resistors and transistors that can turn on and off uh, some load on the output before the on off switch to the output and this is of course to give a minimum load because this is a switch mode converter and you don't want it to run without a load but when you do load the output of course you want to turn this off again so you minimize heat loss so it's, it's that, that is actually quite clever uh, done those are the output current sense resistors and uh, on the other side you'll have the current uh, sense amplifier also the um, the signal path of the of the whole uh, powertrain here that is uh, of course the primary fed the transformator and the diode rectifier diode the rectifier capacitors um, this is the first uh, the common mode choke and then there's another filter here made with the uh, first capacitor and uh, an inductor and then I don't know if I can get some light in here to show show you guys this oh come on man why isn't this difficult see more ferrite and then another capacitor and this is actually funny this is a transistor, not a FED. And they're turning it on with another transistor, also not a FED. And it is coupled with emitter resistors so that they are not using this in on-off mode, but in linear mode to on-off the output. But why are they doing this and adding a big heat sink on this instead of driving it completely on? This puzzles me a little bit. I don't know why you intentionally wanted to, uh, the output on off switch to be really really bad or added a lot of loss even in 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 zero load there's a half a volt over this one so, so that is a little bit funny why it's done like this and there's uh, they work and they turn on and off and everything but it's just made really weird and then I thought this was uh, in the beginning. I, I thought these were the the regulator for the power supplies, but this is actually a uh, two point one volt um, linear regulator. So from the ten volts, you have these two resistors in series before the voltage goes to the two point one volt, and this is of course a voltage used for the analog systems. So and then you, yeah, of course you have your yeah, another DS pick. And another um, up, uh, isolator. Those runs are at uh, 2.1 gigahertz internally. You have the decoupling capacitor that was oh so important. If you look at the data sheet, and it is actually on the other side and far away with long thin tracks. Hmm. And all those uh, data signals to the two uh, microcontrollers. It goes up to the main display board this is really nicely made so there's a backup for something that needs to be backed up maybe a clock or some, something I guess these will be IO expansion driving LEDs or driving all the buttons we got some RAM and some flash for the program and this will be a uh, Linux CPU, I guess. So I don't know this kind of CPU, but of course it's a microcontroller on micro, yeah, like a powerful CPU running this. And of course the, the display and a little EMC problem solver. So I need to go in here and uh, get the display out and uh, solve the the display and to get this out see we need to take out the two screws on the sides and then 
we can slide out the display the the whole front and then get access to those screws they're very difficult to see here but of course this is how you disassemble the entire front I will not take this apart before I have the new display so maybe there will come a follow-up if and when this display ever shows up nobody knows look at the aluminum plates how they are scratched they are made of the oldest piles of whatever they could find this is really funny so you can upgrade this with with an IEEE interface and then you just poke out this piece of plastic and stick in the module and you'll see the two holes for mounting the IEEE module and of course the micromatch uh, connector for the the interface and there is another pick for the communication interface and uh, to handle the ethernet and the USB so how many switch mode supplies and how many CPUs have we got in this power <laughs> power supplies oh yeah there's also a switch mode here and not just a normal switch mode oh no this is actually also quite nice as far as I can see this one is also with power factor and everything extra filtered really really a nice power supply and very powerful too Yeah, no problems here. This one is not going to blow up by the two times 50 watts of output here. Because it's set here, 50 watt plus 50 watt, that is 100. Yeah, but the main supply will do 200. Well, if it is air cooled, and what I see here is one really nice fan and they also put this fan in rubber or yeah now you can see it for vibrations so this is good too yeah i think i will uh release this video now and then maybe when the display show up we can have a follow-up this is all the power supplies for the display part and whatnot and we got nice LEDs at every supply light that lights up to show that it's running so that is really nice